how context affects APIs. And, and that's why I've got three different pictures of myself up. Because people interact with me in different ways, and I respond according to the context. So this is me as the CTO of a, of a startup with a jacket and a shirt with a collar on it. That's me. I, I play in an Irish band. So that's me playing in an Irish band. Uh, I have a very different context when I'm playing music than when I'm... And this is me as a, as a parent with my two kids. And again, I have a very different context when I'm with my family and, and behaving with them. And, and that's really what I'm trying to get at here is think about the context and how it applies to your API design, to your API usage, and how you interact with API users. Uh, we do have a product. That's one of the reasons why I guess we're talking here is we have an API management product. I'm not going to talk about that. If you want to hear a bit more about it, Elena here is talking tomorrow at 3.45 about, a, um, about her offering, which is called API Culture, which is, I guess, Spanish for beekeeping. Is that right? Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, they've got this cute little bee theme with it and the honeycombs. And they've built their API solution using our manager. So she's a great reference. So I'll let her talk about that. Um, I will mention it occasionally, but that's just because I can't help it. So one of the things I think is really interesting is this chart. This is a great chart. I stole this from a friend of mine at Fujitsu, and he stole it from a chap called a from from a company called A.T. Kearney. And this talks about how the market has evolved over the last sort of I guess really 50 years. And I think there's a lot of acceleration going on at this point in time, which is that people have. When, I mean, for example, I f my first job was with IBM, my first real job. And when I worked at IBM in the 80s, they had everything. They had their own travel agents, their own photocopier division, their own stationery. They just did everything themselves. And uh, it seemed really weird to me, uh, coming f not having worked in a company, that they should just like, be their whole universe. Um, and these days, nobody does that anymore. People partner, outsource. Uh, and, and work with other organizations. And one of the, the real things that's pushed that is the cost per transaction. We've reduced the transaction cost of doing business across organizations. And what that means is you can use the best organization to do it because it doesn't cost extra to do that. If you have to fill in a purchase order in triplicate in order to get some pencils, it's very expensive. So you choose your internal pencil provider. But if you can just um, use a, something like RID and Commerce to get your pencils at the best cost uh, without any transaction cost, then you create these firstly capability-based organizations and then these value webs. And I think this has been a real driver for API, which is that these value webs don't have any inherent construction. So what you want to do is you want to participate in as many of those value webs as you can. And that's really what we've heard a lot about uh, today in various talks. This is another interesting slide, again, which I stole off um, somebody, and a chap called Keith Hopper. And this is really about how the world is changing with long tail uh, and the web. And what this is is that vendors typically push the most popular uh, aspects or the most, you know, the simplest to, to provide. But the long tail pulls variety and difference. And a really good example of this is if you just look at my blog, my top 10, the top 10 Google AdWord search terms drive one quarter of the traffic. So you might think, well, that's amazing. I have just 10 search terms. I can drive more traffic. But the bottom 250 drive 18% of the traffic. That's the bottom 250. There's a huge chunk in the middle. I wouldn't even look at the bottom 250 search terms on my website, and yet they're driving 20% of the traffic. So all sorts of interesting things are happening. And, and so one of the things that some of the implications of these two things put together is, you know, firstly, obviously we've seen the API growth. We've heard everyone talk about the huge growth in APIs. But uh, the other thing that's really interesting is how to apply context to your API, and not just necessarily macro context, but potentially micro context. How can you 
think about the long tail of usage. And, and I will give some examples of that later that I think are really interesting. The other thing that's obviously become really key to this whole world is federated security. And, and I, feel, uh, I, I feel quite proud of the fact that my, my, my organization, we have an open source federated identity solution. And, and for years, everyone said, well, guys, why have you got that? Why on earth are you doing that? When no one else in, in your market space is doing that, they're all leaving it to experts like Ping. And it's because we, from the start, believed that federated security was really important. And I think OAuth and OAuth 2 have really proven that. People are actually using federated security protocols in a, in a huge scale in a regular way that, that just a few years ago there was basically no federated security. So I'm going to talk about various different contexts. I'm going to talk about contexts like monetization, like location, like mobile, like regulation and rules. That's an interesting compliance. Those are some interesting contexts. Obviously, identity and security. And I think ecosystem ties back to what I was talking about with value webs. So let's just start with mobile. That's a very simple one. Uh, Everyone knows that, and we've heard it again and again today, that mobile is one of the key usages of APIs. Now, wh what does the mobile context mean to your API design and your API usage? Well, does anyone know what these things are? These, are, these things are narrow boats. This is, this is the form of transport that existed in England before trains. And bizarrely enough, there's no reason why we shouldn't be using these things now. They are, they're very efficient. They have incredibly low energy costs. But they do have one problem, which is the latency is very slow. The bandwidth is big. You can pack an awful lot of stuff into 70 foot by 6 foot or whatever it is. And you can move it around the country for practically nothing. But it takes a, these things go at about 5 miles an hour. So the latency is incredibly slow. And that's basically the problem we have with mobile phones. So even with 3G, I can actually get. 10 megasecond streaming on here, but the latency is three to four or many more times higher than through my normal internet connection. The latency here on the French network is appalling. I was using it earlier. I'm sorry, French guys, but it's about 10 times slower than my, than my latency at home. So what do you do to deal with that? What you do is you create APIs that consolidate function for mobile apps. So you might design a quite fine-grained API that someone's going to use if they have a high latency connection. This is a picture of a model we call service chaining, where I'm calling the first, uh, the first API, and then I'm taking the results back, and I'm using those to call the next API, taking the results back, calling them to call a third API, and then I'm mangling all those results together so that the, inter the external mobile client has only one interaction. Another example of that is something from eBay, an open source project they created called Coolio. Coolio is, again, designed for exactly this purpose. It's actually quite a nice little language, a sort of DSL for doing this. Another context that's important is time. Well, why is time important? Well, today in Europe is Cyber Monday, right? It's not Cyber Monday in the States. That was last week for some reason. But for some reason, we have it a week later, according to the papers. So uh, eBay uses my software as a gateway. And they, they publicly state that they do more than 1 billion transactions a day through this. That's actually about a year out of date. They average do about 2, two sorry, did I say 1 million? I said, meant to say 1 billion. They, they average about 2 billion transactions a day. Last Sunday, they did 3.5 billion transactions because it's Cyber Monday, or Cyber Sunday actually was their busiest day, it turns out, this year. So what does that mean for your API? Well, it certainly means you're going to have to think about this. You know, They have to plan for completely different behavior on certain times of the year than other times of the year. Now. I can't talk about eBay's internal structures, but you might consider that a company may build in an elastic model, or they may build in different throttling policies based on time of year or time of 
action. So there are things you want to consider when building a very high volume usage that has particularly strong peaks. Another obvious context is security. And everyone I'm, I'm assuming everyone here understands the concept of an API key. An API key is what uh, informs the system of which app or which client you are. Out of the API key, you can key off a lot of context. So a typical thing you would do is you would take that, that key, you pass it to the key server, but at the same time you would key off things like a throttling policy or a usage policy from that. You might actually key off uh, different behavior completely. So uh, in, in, in our gateway, you can key off whether this goes to a sandbox or to the real production system based on the key. So you can pull in all kinds of policies out of that key. You could um, do something further than that. But the key itself, you may want more. With OAuth 2, and in fact with OAuth 1, there are two different models you can use. There's two-legged and three-legged. With two-legged, you're fundamentally just identifying the app that's calling. With three-legged, you're identifying the app and the user. So now you have some context about the identity of the person as well as the identity of the app that's calling. You have a combination. And what you can do is now you can firstly apply context and policies based on the app, and then you can apply further sets of policies and context based on the user. So this gets kind of interesting. You, as a, as a user, may be using two different apps on your, on your iPhone or your Android phone, and you can have two different uh, ways through into the same API. Maybe that one app you're using and another app you're using are both using the same APIs, but that you're getting different contextual behavior because of the app you're using and who you are. So that starts to get quite interesting here. Another way that you can build that in is through this thing called Zacamol. Do any of you come across Zacamol? Do any of you use Zacamol? No. Zacamol is a bit painful, and I will admit that. It's a little, of an, it's a little nasty language in XML, and XML is not a great, lang great model for writing languages. But it's really powerful, and it embodies a really nice idea, which is that you build policy-based access to systems. So instead of capturing the access or the entitlement rights to a system based on sort of hard coding it in your app, you extract it out and put it in a policy. So what does this mean in real life? What it means is that the context of your identity may change. So in other words, I may be accessing an API trying to find out someone's salary in my company. right? And if I'm doing it because I'm acting as their manager, then I'm allowed to do it. If I'm doing it acting as a nosy CTO, then I'm not allowed to do it. So the same person may be acting in different roles, and, and the context may affect the way that API responds to me. So I think that's a really interesting aspect. And Zacamole is a very powerful technology for doing that. If you haven't come across it or looked at it, I recommend you do. Uh, there's a beautiful picture of how it all works. The basic idea is that there's a, something called a policy enforcement point. In API terms, that would be your API gateway, most likely, that would be enforcing access. And it would be talking to some kind of back-end uh, policy decision point that's doing this. Uh, one of the interesting things you can do with Zacamole is you can kind of turn it on its head. So we actually have a uh, working with somebody who wants to not just say, can Paul access uh, Chris's salary? He wants to do the op they want to do the opposite. They want to say, who is it who can make this trade on this date? But it's a bank, guess what? And because they're a bank, they, they're worried about governance processes. They want to reverse query the Zacamole policies and say, actually, let me know everybody who can ruin the bank by doing too big a trade, and then I can go and review that list and see if it's, if it's right or not. We heard a lot, if you were in Steve 
Blacknick session. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, we heard a lot about Twitter, and there was a whole discussion about monetization. I think monetization is really, really important within the context of APIs. And uh, we, we've just, I don't know, if you're following the news, uh, a company called People Browser has just successfully um, got the court to allow them to continue using Twitter's firehose, despite the fact that Twitter tried to, to shut them off. Who knows how long that will last? That's a temporary injunction. But it's definitely a, a fail on the point of view of, of Twitter to have got into this situation where they're you know, having to go to court to defend their business decisions and so forth. And that's purely, I believe, because they didn't come up with a decent model and a decent approach for monetization first. They've tried to retrofit it. The reason they bought so many Twitter clients is because they're, they were trying to buy back their monetization um, from the people who are actually getting the monetization and so forth. So it's a bit of a mess. And I think this is a really important aspect. And of course, monetization context does drive a lot of what we're talking about. So earlier in, in Steve's talk, we had this discussion about usage-based throttling and trying to throttle people in order to create a, a business model. And of course, people are going to do that because it's a way of creating a, a, a context that, that creates monetization. Another way I've come across is sneakier. I actually have dealt with a, an organization that does real-time data feeds. And these real-time data feeds are very valuable to their customers. I, I'm not going to tell you exactly what domain it's in, because I'll, they'll probably kill me. But what they do is really sneaky. What they do is, they, if you are in the class of users who basically get free access to the data, they randomly manipulate the latency with which they ship it back to you. And they actually have complex event processing software that tries to spot if people are misusing the data. So they can actually spot when people are using data in a way that, 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 that they shouldn't be as part of the terms of service and the monetization strategy. And when they spot this, they then slow up that data feed to the person so it, the data is out of date and therefore uh, not useful to them and they can't make money out of it. So that's, that's very sneaky, but it's actually um, quite an effective strategy for this particular organization. Uh, it's a really interesting model that I've come across. And, and I take no credit for this at all. This, is, this has been fascinating. We've had a number of organizations come to us and say, we want to use your software to do this. And it's really blown me away. And what they're really trying to do is to create cloud-based ecosystems around APIs. And, and that's, that's too many buzzwords in one sentence for anyone to get their head around immediately. But I'll, I'll kind of explain it. And I think there's a real concept here about ecosystems of APIs that match real life ecosystems. And this is a really interesting example. This is a presentation that's available on the web from Boeing. And Boeing have this concept called the digital airline. And what happens is, with Boeing, that they build a plane. And you'd think that would be it, but it's not. For the next 30 years, they carry on having a relationship with this plane. And it's not just the plane they have the relationship with. It's all sorts of other organizations that also interact with that plane. The airline, the repairs, the, the outfitters when it gets a, a refit, all kinds of different organizations, the, few, the people who refuel it. And the plane has become, over the last 20 years, incredibly smart. It's full of data. The plane actually captures so much data that they can't possibly stream it back and use it all. It's, it, it absolutely it fills up hard disks if on each flight with how much data. So what they're trying to do is using all that data, the maintenance and engineering, the operations, the, the airlines, the ground ops, is to create a, 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 a digital ecosystem that matches the real life ecosystem around this. And what they're doing is creating APIs around this. But they're doing something more interesting, too. They're creating the ability for other organizations 
to populate their ecosystem with APIs in a smart way. So what they're trying to do is say, we don't know everything there is to know about planes. We don't know everything there is to know about this ecosystem. We want to create a space where there is a highly reliable set of APIs that match this. Now, you might ask, well, what is it that's different from any normal e API model? The, I guess what's different is they're trying to uh, add a level of um, management, reliability, and support that fits their ecosystem. And their ecosystem is obviously very, very important that systems are highly reliable. Uh, and you know, Boeing has this reputation amongst, you know, for, for making planes that actually stay up in the air and don't crash. And so you know, it's very important for them that the ecosystem maintains that same reputation. I think this is a great quote that tries to capture some of that, and I think captures a lot of what's going on from the API business. And, and I have to give credit to a friend of mine called Dan Murphy, who does the APIs for Pearson, who, who put me onto this quote. I stole it from him. Um, you see, it can tell I'm really good at stealing things from people. This, this is about uh, inventions that actually empower others to unleash their creativity. And I think that's really what API is all about and what we're all hearing today is that this is all about not just what can we do, it's about how we can help other people. And that's really what we heard uh, Swift talk about in the hackathons. So what, what the, the kind of really interesting thing about what's happening in this Boeing scenario is it's not just an environment for publishing APIs or, or for consuming APIs. It's actually an environment in which you can write and create APIs and host those as well. So this App Factory is a concept of ours, which is actually about building code in the cloud. So using a cloud-based model. So you sign up, you get an SVN, you get a Hudson build system, and you get a development staging and production runtime. And so as you push your code through into production, it, your APIs then get published into the API store. So this is actually building a space, a context, where parties can work together using APIs that goes beyond just the fact that those APIs are published, but actually talks about the environment in which they run and in which they interact. And, and another example, so that's really what I would call a, a kind of like an ecosystem or a vertical or a domain community PaaS, where you have your, your APIs, but then you have an API cloud in which people uh, can build further APIs and can interact. And that really comes on to my last point, which is about regulation and, and compliance. This is kind of a slightly humorous set of rules for, for golf during wartime. Um, uh, so, you know, if a, a, a player whose stroke is affected by the simultaneous explosion of a bomb may play another ball from the same place, penalty one stroke. But, but a lot of people work in, in, in very regulated environments. And actually, this is a really interesting example. Um, uh, this, is a, this is something I came across from, from London, which is an organization called Betfair. And the betting industry is highly regulated. And Betfair offer a lot of APIs, and they have done for a number of years. And they're, they're, very, you know, they're one of the biggest providers of APIs in, in the UK, um, very heavily used. But those APIs cannot be used for certain reasons because of regulation. So you can use those APIs to bet as much as you like as an individual. But if you happen to be doing it on behalf of another person, then suddenly you're a betting organization and you're, you should be regulated by the betting uh, community, by the, by the Betting Gambling Commission or whatever it's called in the UK. So what, what Betfair have done is to build a cloud in which you can build and deploy and run your betting apps that utilize those APIs, but they run it. So they run it on your behalf. So they are taking on the compliance issues, not you. So you get the freedom of I innovation and coding and, and building the app, but they get to take on the compliance. So now that's interesting because, of course, they don't just want to deploy any code there. So what they actually do is as you, you write your app and it gets deployed, they go through checks and security validation and compliance checks and all sorts of things before 
they actually push your code into production. So this is what I mean about building ecosystems clouds where the regulatory or ecosystem rules change the very context in which those APIs are used and provided. And finally, this isn't really about context, but it's kind of about learning from that context, is of course measure everything. So analyze what's happening in the usage of your APIs and iterate to improve that. So basically, my strategies for contextual API usage are, firstly, I think you can't do this without some kind of manager. You need to, you need to be controlling and managing the API usage. Because a lot of those contextual points, hook points, come there. Uh, think about monetization and manage that from the start. Think about the regulatory barriers. They might be a barrier to everyone else. If you can somehow open them up, then that can be a differentiating factor on your behalf, just like Betfair have done with their cloud. Uh, participate in ecosystems, but also think about enabling those ecosystems as a different context for your APIs. Think about how cloud can change the context in which the APIs are offered and utilized to create different business models. And of course, measure and iterate. And that was an awful lot of slides in a very short period of time. But I guess what I'm talking about here is uh, the, the old way of doing business was just to do everything internally. The next generation is to expose APIs. and the, Putting the cloud in actually allows you to work with your partners in that value web and have an indirect relationship with their customers as well, which really expands the concept of a value web. So that was trying to summarize all of that. And um, the only way is up. So there we go. I'm finished. Uh, there's my Twitter and so forth. Are there any questions? <laughs>